Welcome everyone to um, to our first public board meeting of 2018. And my name is Lorraine Cunningham, and I'm the chair of uh, of the board, and I'm here to represent the board as a whole. We um, um, I'd like to welcome all those who are live streaming today through our Facebook or Twitter. Um, we actually have discovered through our, our metrics that we have a lot of people joining us through that. So I just want to say welcome to those who are, who are online. Um, I called the meeting to order. I want to acknowledge that TransLink operates throughout the traditional territories of the Lower Mainland Coast Salish people. And specifically, this meeting is being held in the traditional territory of the Kikite First Nations. We take safety here at TransLink <clears throat> very important to us and I just want to take a moment to remind everyone of the location of the emergency exits. The nearest exit is across the hall through those doors. In the event of an alarm we ask you to please exit in an orderly fashion through the stairwells and meet at the muster station which is at the construction fence at the so outside um, facing the Sapperton Skytrain station. For those who have any mobility devices please do not use the elevator. Uh, but gather in the vicinity of the stairwell and uh, there's a safe refuge area there and our floor wardens will look, um, advise the fire department uh, that we need to prioritize your safe exit from the building. In the event of an earthquake, we please ask you to remember to drop, drop cover and hold on until the shake, shaking has stopped. Before we get started with meeting today, I'd like to take a moment to welcome Mayor Corrigan, Mayor Walton and Karen Horcher to their first public official, uh, official public board meeting. It's great to have them as part of our, uh, of our board uh, table and um, it's nice to have uh, new individuals. I'd also like to point out that Mayor Walton will only be with us through to the end of this year as he's announced this week that he's not running after 23 years of elected public service. Um, as the mayor of the District of North Vancouver, he's also served five years as the chair of Mayor's Council. Let me be the first uh, on behalf of the board to say how much we've appreciated all your hard work, Richard, and um, all the focus that you've had on TransLink and the transit file and your championing of the Mobility Pricing Commission. And um, we wish you all the best as you move to the next phase of your life. This isn't retirement for you, I know, but, uh, but it is going to be a, a new phase of your life. But with that being said, we still have a lot to accomplish this year, so the year's just beginning for us. It's been an exciting few weeks here at TransLink, um, and with its customers, I want to recognize the great work of both the Mayor's Council and the province to move the Phase 2 projects closer to reality. I'm sure everyone knows that the Mayor's Council reached an agreement in recent weeks to fund the regional share for Phase 2 for their 10-year vision, and we're getting closer to those becoming a reality, and soon the customers customers will be able to benefit from these crucial investments in the years ahead. Kevin will be sharing more details about this shortly in his, uh, in his update, his CEO update. I'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge that this is Janet Austin's last public board meeting with our team. Uh, of course, last week Janet was appointed as Br British Columbia's next le Lieutenant Governor and we're all very proud of her. I'm sure everyone around the table can attest to Janet's leadership that she's brought to our group and we're sad that she's leaving us, but we're excited that she's going to be taking on this new prestigious role. On a personal note, I'd like to say that Janet, Janet and I have become good friends over the years because of our work here at TransLink. And, um, and just because you're moving to Victoria part-time, <laughs> it doesn't mean we're not going to be able to walk our dogs and have some fun uh, in between all your official functions that you have to do. So I know that you don't want to leave Vancouver um, and that you're going to make sure that you bridge yourself between, uh, between here and Victoria. But, um, but I thought before we get immersed in today's agenda, I'd like to just provide you with an opportunity to say a few words, Janet. Yeah, um, thanks, Lorraine. Um, you know, obviously, I'm excited about this new role. It's not something that I had ever expected. Um, but I have to say, I'm feeling actually very sad to be leaving TransLink. Um, I've been uh, completely captured, really, by the vision um, and the work of this organization, and I'm incredibly proud of what's been accomplished in the last year, and um, and also proud to have played a small part in in that. Um, just reflecting on the 
uh, progress I think we've made over the past year. There's a few things I, that are particularly meaningful to me and, and one is um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the superb leadership of Kevin Desmond and our excellent team. Um, the focus, um, um, the care in execution that you brought to this work has been really just exceptional and um, I feel very proud to have had the opportunity to work with you. I also want to acknowledge the, the leadership of, of Lorraine Cunningham, our board chair. This is more than a full-time job for Lorraine. Um, I see how hard she works, how, how much time she puts into uh, ensuring that everything goes smoothly at the board level and, and the excellent, really um, conscientious support that's provided to the entire team. And also in terms of my board colleagues, um, you couldn't get a more conscientious uh, group to serve this organization. Always well prepared, always thoughtful, and really set the standard for the kind of board members that this organization uh, deserves and needs to carry the agenda forward into the future. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge how important it's been for us as a board to work so collaboratively with the Mayor's Council. Um, the initiative of forming a number of joint committees I think has been really instrumental in helping us to ensure that we're aligned on key objectives and that we move the business of TransLink forward expeditiously um, and also enables us, I think, both sides of our government's, governance system to bring our, our very best to the service of this organization and also to the service of the region. So I'm going to miss this work, um, but I will watch with great interest as, as uh, it unfolds in the future um, and I will always be a champion for TransLink and for public transit. It's been an honor to serve, so I thank you for that. Thank you, Janet. So with that, let's call our meeting to order and approve the agenda that's in front of us. I do have one um, small change in that we're going to move item 5.4, uh, the update on the, um, the mayor's 10-year vision. Uh, up ahead to uh, following item 3.4. So we're going to move that on the agenda. Um, and um, with that, I think if some, I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Thank you. And all in favor? Thank you very much. Okay. So we have minutes from December 14th of 2017. It seems like a long time ago that we had those, uh, that meeting. Um, again, and you've all had an opportunity to review those minutes. Are there any errors or omissions? Move their approve. Thank you, Larry. And all in favor of approving the minutes? Thank you. All right. So we have um, the public delegations uh, is now the next order of business. And we have um, in our package a response to past public delegations that's provided to you. And that's part of a consent agenda. So if I can ask for approval of the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Larry. And all in favor? Thank you. All right, so we're going to start our public de delegations. We have four delegates that are speaking to us today. Um, I just want to remind you of the process. So everyone has been allocated five minutes. Gigi has a uh, clock that she provides to you just to provide guidance for you as to how much time. Sometimes when we're speaking, we don't realize how much time has gone by or you have a lot more time available to you. So I just ask you to watch that clock and be aware of, um, of how much time um, is left. And, and then we'll, um, we'll ask people to wrap up within their five minutes. So the first um, uh, delegate is Geraldine Jordan. And I think Geraldine's in place with her trusty assistance. Okay. Thank you, good morning. I'm actually going to be like a cat for more minutes. Five minutes, and then a couple minutes more. Yeah, I, I think that, um, why don't we see how you do within the five minutes? I, you know, I think for us, we need to stay on time. And so I appreciate if you could try and keep it within the five minutes. Okay, so I'll do that. There's a couple things I'll edit out on the fly. Okay. And then you could ask me questions about the things that aren't in there. Okay. In my talk. Okay, thank you. Um, so good morning. My name is Geraldine Jordan and I live at number 52-8888-216th Street in Langley. And I wish to speak before the TransLink Board regarding the fact that residents in North Langley living in proximity to 216th Street will be at significant risk of increased pollution, noise and safety hazards due to the predicted large volume of commercial truck traffic associated with the 216th Street and Highway 1 interchange. 
The neighborhoods in proximity to 216th Street North include two elementary schools, two preschools, a daycare, a community garden, a township of Langley Park, and numerous residential areas. Residents do not want a highway accessible major arterial truck route through these residential neighborhoods. Such incompatible land uses would put at significant risk the safety and health of all residents, including school children. As citizens, we are concerned that the designation of a major road network will be synonymous with a major arterial heavy commercial truck route designation. So enclosed in my submission is a copy of a petition um, that has been submitted to the Township Council and emailed to TransLink with over 1,700 signatures. This petition states that we, the undersigned, petition that 216th Street south of 80th Avenue to the highway be restricted to local commercial truck traffic only. You may also be aware of a letter of concern from the Francophone School Board and a petition from Topham Elementary School staff. Professionals with scholarly, scholarly backgrounds, such as Dr. Carlston from the University of British Columbia, have provided evidence-based knowledge to this matter in terms of the implications to health, safety, and well-being of school children and residents. In addition, there have been meetings with elected officials as well as, de as delegations to the Township Council. Moreover, there have been numerous newspaper articles, letters to the editor, and a David Suzuki Foundation Blue Dot video which indicate that commercial trucks along 216th Street North would have deleterious impacts on school children as well as all living in this area. As part of the TransLink application process to remove municipal truck routes and to apply for MRN funding, TransLink will have received a supporting document from the Township of Langley entitled the North Langley Truck Route Review addressed to Mr. Paul Cadero from Mr. Gary Vleek of Creative Transportation Solutions, dated April 12, 2017. This document, upon which TOL has built its application, has not been properly reviewed or interpreted by Township Council or staff. There are many features that lack coherence, credibility, and validity. I'll summarize some here. Um, some of the data in the tables that are provided are not valid. It would appear that 216th Street, given those values, should actually be taken out of the truck route network as it is. A lot of preference and bias is given to Fort Langley truck route removal and moving truck routes uh, as a, a substitute area to 216th Street, which is actually a residential area also. I'm happy to speak more on that if you wish. The report is not evidence-based and does not have technical analysis, and so it would be embarrassing if TransLink makes decisions that aren't evidence-based using proper and sound technical analysis. The public has provided considerable feedback to Township Council and Township staff. In addition, considerable public involvement occurred at a public information ses session hosted by Township staff in June 2017. As of January 18, the written public feedback from that session had not been reviewed by staff and as such has not been forwarded to Council or TransLink to determine the level of citizen support or opposition to the TransLink application. In an internal email obtained through FOI written on Friday, January 27, 2017, Mr. Graham Cross, MOTI Senior Traffic Operations Engineer, stated to Mr. Jerry Fleming from MOTI and Binney and Mr. Jonathan Ho from Binney, Quote, I'm quoting, strategically, it would be best for the ministry to ask TOL to be more forthright in their traffic management strategies to keep non-local traffic off of residential streets during this interim period until 192 interchange is constructed. Also, they, TOL, should specifically address commercial vehicles on TOL roads and the safety adjacent to École des Voyageurs and Topham Elementary. I have examined the South Coast British Columbia Transportation Authority Act in the Act, Part 2, Section 18, Subsection 4, it states that the authority must have the consent of each of the municipalities within which a major road is located before designating that major road as being part of the major road network. There has been no consent given by the residents in our municipality for designating 216th Street north of Highway 1 as a truck route with highway connectivity, nor part of the MRN. In fact, MOTI has indicated that it is possible to create signage on Highway 1 to divert trucks to the next nearest exit. As citizens, we are concerned that the designation of MRN will be synonymous with a major arterial heavy commercial truck route designation jeopardizing the health, safety, and well-being of particularly our school children, but also all living on, in proximity to 216 Street North. We want TransLink to uphold its mission so that our region's livability is enhanced with sustainable transportation networks embraced by our communities and our people. 
The specific actions I want tra the Translating Board to take is, one, assisting the Township of Langley to restrict 216th Street south of 80th Avenue to the highway to only local commercial traffic by not designating this segment of road as part of the MRN. And two, safeguarding two elementary schools, two preschools, daycare, community garden, Township of Langley Park, and numerous residential areas along 216th Street North. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much, Geraldine. And I appreciate all your input. Uh, Sani is, um, uh, Zane is here and he's our expert on this and he'd be happy to meet with you afterwards to discuss this. Okay. Oh, so thank you very much. Is this a copy for us? That's right. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you that very much. That contains, in the written notes that I have in there, contains some of the information that I wasn't able to go over okay. in terms of the technical report and I'm happy to, to discuss anything. And if you have any okay. questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And our next speaker is Indrani Marjolin. I hope I said your name correctly. You did. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So welcome. So you're here to talk about U passes. Yes. Yes. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrani Margolin. I'm a faculty member at uh, the UNBC School of Social Work, and I run the program he down here in Vancouver. And this is Amrit, who is a student representative in our school. So um, thank you for hearing us. We're here to speak about. Um, being included in the UPASS program and obtaining UPASS cards for our students. We attempted to obtain these passes for just under 30 students since 2014 without success. We tried to partner with the Langara Student Union. We are located in the Langara College. Um, we haven't had success with that route. And so we are attempting to come directly to TransLink to see if we can be added to the agreement. Um, I was told in communications with TransLink in 2014 that um, they would consider adding us to the agreement when it renewed in 2016. Last year, two of our students, Tasha and Amrit, uh, came to this board meeting to speak on March 30th to present our case. And since that time, our student union, along with myself and students, worked with this board's suggestions to keep speaking with the province, which including conversations with the mayor of Prince George, the new BC, Minister of Advanced Education, Melanie Mark, MLAs in both PG and Vancouver Langara, um, including Shirley Bond and Andrew Wilkinson, asking for assistance in how to best proceed to no avail. So the cost to students is between 60 and $120 per month. And these are full-time students. Some of them are single parents. Um, they're required to complete two practicums where they need to use public transit three days per week for two full semesters, which becomes quite costly for students. They are also future full paying consumers of public transit in Vancouver and will be significant contributors to the Lower Mainland and BC communities in their roles as future professional social workers. So we understand from communications with Jagdeep from the UPASS program last year that the contribution agreement between the province and TransLink will come up again this April 2018. The issues he brought forth to us that were through referendums by the student association, students need to pay for the mandatory student fees toward the program and participating schools need to administer the program. So that's on the institutions. And that the program currently only has 11 existing schools that are listed there. He said that not currently extending the program to students for other post-secondary institutions has already been identified and discussed by the province, between the province and TransLink for future consideration and that April 2018 contract 
amendment will be the time to consider expanding eligibility for the program. So with that context, we are here today in front of you asking how do we move forward? UNBC is willing to administer the program on behalf of our students. Students are willing to pay the student fees for this program. By offering our program in Vancouver, we are meeting a need for professional social workers in the Lower Mainland. And there is a demand for additional future programming that we would like to provide. Students have de dedicated significant time and effort to try and make this necessity of life for them in a large metropolitan community a reality, but we are feeling blocked at every attempt we make. We're here today to ask for your support and to request that you let us know how we can move forward so that UNBC students registered in Vancouver have access to the same more affordable transportation that is available to all other post-secondary students in the Lower Mainland. As we have already described, we've done everything in our power to make this happen, so we want to know how we can come together with TransLink to solve this issue. We really do appreciate having this opportunity and thank you for listening to us today. Great. Thank you very much. Do you want to add something? I think you covered it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for that. It is my understanding at the end the, the province makes the decision, but we can certainly at Translate continue to use our good offices um, uh, with you, with you, the, <coughs> excuse me, with you and the University of Northern BC um, with our group and, and see if we can move the ball forward. I can ask you to talk to Chris Daker um, over there a little bit. Chris's group uh, manages the UPASS program um, here at Translate. I don't know if you've engaged with with her or, or her, it sounds like you've engaged with her team going forward. And we'll look into it. We'll see if we can, if, if it makes sense and how we can have that discussion as well with the province on your behalf. Okay. Um, the last thing I'll mention is when I have had conversations with provincial, elected, provin um, elected people, they have told me that it's up to TransLink. So I've, I, I've just struggled with who's the decision maker. Well, well, we will, we will sort that out with you, okay. Okay. Um, one way Thank or the you. other. Whether Thank or not you. that's the right answer that you're looking for is a different story, but we, we'll sort that out. Thank we, you very I will much. I personally take a look at this. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks very much for bringing that to our attention. Uh, our next speaker is Roderick Lewis. And you're walking around, so you can just walk right into your chair there, Roderick. Welcome. Thank you. I'm a bit of a stander, so I hope you guys don't mind if I stand while I address you. No, nope, you're absolutely fine. As long as the microphone can um, can hear you, that would be just fine. And I note that you delivered some uh, material to each of our, our spots, and I know that we had this emailed to us as well yesterday. So, um, so everyone's had an opportunity to look at that. Okay, so your five minutes. Thank you. I'm Roderick Lewis. I'm a White Rock resident. I've lived there for around 19 years. Till three years ago, I paid little to zero attention to civic and transportation issues in the city. And I'm here before you today regarding uh, a matter that relates to the city of White Rock. It's application that I understand uh, Jeff Cross has written a report for today's meeting about, which is a request from the city of White Rock to be given permission to operate an independent public transit service during the roughly the May to end of September months. In the materials that I emailed as well as on paper I circulated this morning, uh, in summary what I uh, say is that White Rock's application should be denied. Uh, it should be denied on two major grounds. Uh, the main one being that the models of buses that the city of White Rock wants to rent over the summer months uh, cannot accommodate persons with disabilities. So people who require walking aids or wheelchairs can't use them because the design of this bus doesn't have a, uh, it's, not a low, it's not a low floor bus, it's actually uh, what they call a trolley bus, but it's not really a, an electric trolley, it's a natural gas powered trolley. And there's no wheelchair lift. Um, please consider, would you license a private public transit service that was only to be used by Caucasians, uh, obviously that's something that would be offensive to many. 
I say this service is offensive because it discriminates against people with disabilities. The second major grounds are that <clears throat> uh, according to Section 5.2 of the uh, South Coast British Columbia Transportation Authority Act, uh, the authority, and I'll read Section 2, the authority may give approval under Subsection 1 if the independent transit services will not reduce the effectiveness or financial viability of the regional transportation system. Um, I say that the automatic effect of this service proposed by White Rock is to have a, an immediate and negative effect on the viability of the services that TransLink operates in the South Surrey White Rock area because the route routes that Right Walk wants to have the, their trolley bus use are almost identical to the three, number 362 and 361 routes, <clears throat> which are shuttle buses that TransLink has operated for a number of years along the White Rock waterfront areas. The purpose of the White Rock water, no, the White Rock application is to have a, a, in quotes, a shuttle, in effect, operating back and forth along the along the waterfront of White Rock. <clears throat> and I say that this is not something that should be allowed uh, for the two reasons it just gave. But additionally, because it allows White Rock to escape from, as as has been the case for going on ten years, from its obligations under Metro Vancouver 2040, is a document that is you, I presume many of you may be familiar with and requirements under Metro Vancouver 2040 <clears throat> to diversify transportation away from privately used automobiles to bicycling, walking, and public transit. Only 20,000 people live in White Rock, very small city, two square miles, and it's an outlier amongst Metro Vancouver's 21 cities in that it's almost entirely uh, non-compliant with the requirements of Metro Vancouver 2040. Uh, for example, uh, if one goes to the White Rock beaches, there's two of them, East Beach and West Beach, there are parking spots for about a thousand automobiles and currently there is a, a high-rise parkade, $12 million high-rise parkade being built which will add another 180. Bicycle parking, there's only 10 bicycle parking spots on West Beach. On East Beach there's parking for just almost 10, I think there's 8 yeah, in total. So there's a huge disparity, and this is something that White Rock refuses to address. Um, <clears throat> additionally, uh, for many years there has been a need for a free bus service along the White Rock waterfront, and I suggest in addition to denying White Rock's application today, and I request that you will undertake the composition of a task force that would be comprised of members of TransLink plus the City of Surrey and White Rock, and the purpose function or in terms of reference of this tax task force loosely would be to assess and identify a, pub, a, a low floor public transit service similar to the articulated buses or the 40 foot buses that you operate throughout the system along the White Rock waterfront. <clears throat> These two types of buses are accessible and those are the types of buses that should be operating along the waterfront free of serve, free of charge, not a, a high floor trolley that cannot accommodate wheelchairs uh, lastly, I want to quickly touch on the uh, invisibility. There are no wayfinding maps and outdoor signs at the White Rock Centre Bus Exchange, which is located at the intersection of White Rock and Surrey. There's no wayfinding signs and maps on the White Rock waterfront that indicate bicycling, walking and transit routes to various city sites and, and to <clears throat> public transit hubs. So if a if there was an agreement by the board members today or an initiative taken to have a joint task force formed to expeditiously put in place a free bus service for the summer months, I request that this, the terms of reference would also include <clears throat> expeditiously installing wayfinding signage at the White Rock Center bus exchange and on the White Rock waterfront areas that would explicitly describe bicycling, walking and public transit routes to local sites. Mr. Desmond is obviously relatively new still to British Columbia and he's walked into a big problem, I say. Uh, so I don't hold this over him as a, as, as a blame, but it's his mess I, I suggest uh, to deal with or whoever he delegates. And uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I'm over my time, I think. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Roderick, for coming and sharing that information with us. Um, our next presenter is Albert Millenius. No questions? No, there's no questions. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Albert. Yeah. I see a few new faces here. Um, uh, 
Uh, Tracy Menard of the Metro Vancouver Alliance cannot be here today. My presentation is based on MVA work, but I have included a few ideas of my own. Tracy speaks for the Metro Vancouver Alliance. Um, I got some new information yesterday, so we rewrote the whole thing last night. It is a work in progress. The title is Social and Environmental Uses of Transit. First of all, funding. Years ago, when the mayors and councillors were the board, they would ask visitors if they had any ideas for funding. I remember Larry Campbell and Mayor Corrigan both asking this question. This was about 10 or 15 years ago. Here's my funding idea. You should formally approach other levels of government for permanent funding for social and environmental uses of transit. It should be written into the purposes of transit and the cost sharing should be there as well. You may already be working on this. I urge you to continue, but to define it and extend it. Yesterday, I heard from a handydar passenger that transit passes are no longer tax deductible. I hope that this is not true, but if it is, you need to protest it right away. This goes in exactly the wrong direction. Social uses of fare subsidy. I note that in the present fare review, the total fare income is to be re rebalanced, but there appears to be no sign there will be a greater, avail a greater availability of low-cost bus passes, transit passes. With the Compass technology, a variety of levels of payment are possible, especially through fare capping. The fare capping method could be used to encourage a variety of worthy programs. The Metro Vancouver Alliance has made this one of their major recommendations. The social use job search. Calgary provides low-income people with cheap bus passes. This would allow people to search for work much more efficiently. The federal government is in charge of unemployment and so should be called upon for permanent subsidy to job search passes administered by TransLink. It will, um, it will create employed citizens and turn them into taxpayers, but TransLink should get credit for it. Social use, transit for jobs, transit for jobs for people with disability. When I started in 1975, very few people with disability had jobs. Now, according to the Disability Alliance, around 40% have some kind of job. Good transit for, for people with disabilities was a major factor. Social use, the reduction of cost through independent living. For the permanently unemployable, cheap transit passes allow people to maintain health and to reduce the burden on the tax base. It costs half as much to live outside the hospital as it does to live inside. Furthermore, the negative effects of unaffordable transit is much more serious. People who can't afford to get to doctors, rehab, physio, etc. deteriorate and become a burden. Give them a pass and they will work hard to stay fit and healthy. Zones. For the above reasons, people with disabilities should permanently be at a single fare. Health maintenance often requires specialists, and specialists are not always nearby. Environmental. If you simply go for more transportation on the theory that more people per vehicle is green enough, you will likely repeat the mistake of the early years of this century when TransLink used dirty high sulfur diesel because it was cheaper. I have been informed by a city councillor that the federal government recently made a contribution to, to maintenance funds. This should be aimed at making transit vehicles the cleanest on the road and there should be a written ongoing commitment to enshrine this. Conclusion. TransLink should have a well-defined environmental and social purpose. The NDP Green Coalition and the new Liberal government are the ones to write this into the mandate and to fund it. Social and environmental aims should be primary purposes of transit, not secondary. Now that's the end of my written presentation, but I'd like to go back to the lady with the pass. Um, I haven't verified yet whether or not she lost her uh, tax deduction, but I will tell you what she was doing with it. Seven times a week she goes down to a, a long-term care facility to assist her husband. She reduces the burden on the nurses and they can help people who don't have family because she helps her husband. Uh, that tax break uh, reduced the burden on our healthcare system. It was a really good idea, so I hope, it, I hope the rumor is not true, but if it is true, I hope it gets reversed. Um, many of my passengers do volunteer work of that type, and if the transit becomes more important, they'll be doing less volunteer work. So. Uh, and cheap passes are a good way to do things, but I don't think that TransLink can actually afford them. So you should ask the senior levels of government for direct subsidies for these things. 
Thank you. Albert, you are perfect. Look, the dinging went and you just wrapped it up. You're the best. Thank you. I want to thank all of our delegates for coming and sharing such important information with us, and I appreciate the time that you take to, uh, to come and uh, speak to the board. Uh, I think it was correct. It, it was spelled correctly on the information that we had, Robert. Well, on the delegation list of six oh, okay. Okay, we'll make sure it's corrected. No worries. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on now to um, our executive reports. And uh, first up is Kevin, who um, has got a lot of exciting information to share with us today. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, um, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, two of our board members, uh, Mayor Walton, um, and your tenure in particular as the, the chair of the Mayor's Council during the gestation period on the 10-year plan. Uh, you were a stalwart uh, supporter of, of a transit vision and the transit vision uh, for our region. So uh, you will be missed. Uh, as, as among the elected officials and mayors um, in this region, to be sure. Uh, and I'm sure we will continue to work with you even um, uh, as you depart as mayor of the uh, District of North Vancouver. But uh, well done, I, I think, on your champion, the, the, the transit cause. Thank you. Uh, and as well to, uh, to Janet Austin. Uh, we have not had much time to, to work together in your relatively brief um, tenure, but... Uh, uh, I consider you, and I, I know a lot of the folks here consider you to be an absolutely amazing woman, and, and um, you are such a, a wonderful addition um, to our board. Uh, we'll miss you, but uh, we'll get to see you wearing a sash now, I guess, <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> going forward. <laughs> but thank you so much, Janet, for, for your time. Um, you added so much uh, around the table. Uh, I know to the board dialogue and for all of us at, at staff as well and your wisdom and your, your sensibilities going forward, so thank you. Uh, so I'll be relatively brief on a, a number of items. Uh, first, as uh, Lorraine mentioned in, in her remarks, and you'll hear more from Jeff Cross uh, shortly, uh, Friday, March 16th was a uh, really a historic um, day, I think, for, for this region and in so many respects is the culmination of, of nine years of um, of work to um, really begin to realize uh, the vision that, as I mentioned, that Mayor Walton helped um, uh, develop um, for this region to improve and expand uh, our transit system, uh, where uh, Minister Selena Robinson, uh, Mayor Corrigan, um, and I um, announced the, the uh, tentative agreement to move forward with the, the program. Uh, that will unlock uh, $7 billion um, of investment uh, going forward. Um, and in that long nine-year gestation period, certainly so many people were, were part of that. Obviously, the staff group uh, at Transli TransLink doing yeoman's work, uh, the partnership that we've had uh, with the mayors um, of this region on the mayor's council, uh, the province, the federal government, um, to be sure we cannot do this without the senior levels of government providing significant grant funding to make this um, program um, feasible. As well, the provincial government helping to su uh, support uh, the final um, element of the deal to bridge the gap um, in funding to make both the capital program and the operating component of the program uh, move forward. And also thanks to all of the stakeholders and advocates in this region who really were tireless for, for years in making the argument of the value of significant transit investment in this region. And, and, and I should note, um, these major, major transit investments are, ha are happening throughout Canada. It's not just Vancouver. In Ontario, in Quebec, in Alberta, uh, their systems are also um, um, in the process of or, or beginning um, a major, major new transit expansions uh, as well. So one could argue there's a little bit of a, a renaissance of, of transit um, in this country. And from my perspective, this comes just in time. We often talk about the, the population growth and the job growth in the region over the next 20 and 30 years, but just over the 10 years that this 10-year plan will cover, 
uh, the province is expecting something like 200,000 additional jobs in this region uh, to go with um, hundreds of thousands of, of new people. So um, I think it's just in time and let's get on with it. Let's get on with uh, implementing this program. Let's get on with uh, extending the Millennium Line uh, to Broadway, uh, along Broadway, the six kilometer uh, Broadway sub subway. The first phase of the Surrey uh, light rail uh, transit program connecting uh, Surrey, uh, connecting uh, Newton and Guilford uh, to Surrey Central. Major expansion, major expansion of the SkyTrain um, system. Um, this will be um, very, very welcomed by our customers going forward realizing some 60% increase in capacity along the SkyTrain network, the Expo Millennium and Canada lines uh, going forward. And investments in our ra major road networks, sidewalks, and uh, bike facilities going forward. Um, I'm also really pleased that the mayors had the wisdom as we were um, putting the program together um, to seek to accelerate the bus service improvements. Um, we spent a lot of time and effort last year putting out a significant amount of bus service, some 200,000 hours is the largest bus service increase in this region in, in, in about a decade, since, um, since around the time of the Olympic Games. Uh, this phase two plan proposal is accelerating much more bus service into this next phase, which is the period of 2020 and 2021, such that by the end of 2021, only halfway through the 10-year plan, we will have implemented two-thirds of the 10-year plan bus service in, improvements. While we're waiting for these major capital projects, on our fixed light, uh, rail network, we've got to be improving the rest of the transit system and the bus network is the best way uh, to do that going forward. Uh, so we are not standing still, we're moving forward uh, on all cylinders with the 10-year with the, uh, plan going forward. Um, Jeff will talk a little bit more about some of the details of what's in the plan, in particular the next phase of public and stakeholder engagement leading up to the anticipated final approval of the plan um, in June. Uh, second, um, uh, ridership through uh, February of this year uh, continues at its very, very strong pace. Through February, ridership is up 5.8%. Uh, that is notable because that's coming on the heels of our record ridership in 2016 and our record ridership in 2017, where we realized a 5.7% increase in ridership. Uh, just this week, we received the information from the American Public Transportation Association, which tracks uh, transit ridership in the United States and Canada. Um, and uh, we have the fastest growing, by a long shot, uh, ridership of any major urban area in Canada and the United States. Um, our ridership growth dwarfs any of the any other major metropolitan region of over a million uh, population. Uh, Phoenix and Seattle come in in effect in a distant uh, second. Um, and in fact, only four major urban areas in Canada and the United States have seen ridership growth during this period of time. There, there is a, a fairly a stunning um, stagnation, if not decline, in, in ridership, at least in, in the United States. So something very different um, is happening here. Uh, certainly uh, uh, fueled by our improvements in service, the Evergreen Line was a game changer for SkyTrain and has been fueling a double-digit increase in ridership um, on the SkyTrain network since it, since it opened in December of 2016. Uh, the significant transit improvements we made throughout the year last year and the first year um, of the 10-year plan. The continued strong economy absolutely has an impact on, on ridership, uh, people getting to and fro for jobs, uh, school, leisure, but that um, absolutely helps to drive ridership. And the continuing high gasoline prices is no doubt um, having an impact uh, on ridership uh, as well. So um, I think that just underscores the import of this 10-year plan and getting on with it and, and the wisdom of our mayors, the wisdom of the provincial government and the federal government in making this funding available. And, and we at TransLink remain absolutely committed to moving forward and delivering on the plan um, as, um, as laid out um, uh, in the schedule and within the funding that is being uh, made available to us. Uh, one of the things I just want to uh, note, in the, the only um, portion of our system last year that had declining ridership, West Coast Express, which declined by 5.5% uh, largely as a result of the opening of the Evergreen Line that was expected. So far this year, in the first two months of the year, ridership is up 7.7%. So I think all, what we saw is really that first year, um, people settling out and changing their, their behavior and hab habits, particularly in Coquitlam and uh, Port Moody when they had the choice of SkyTrain versus West Coast Express, 
we are seeing ridership increasing back, just goes to show that the West Coast Express is a very, very important component uh, of our system going forward now uh, in the future. Uh, I'd like to just comment very briefly, uh, retrospectively, on some of the major things that happened um, in the first quarter um, of this year, uh, led by the very important announcement um, by the provincial government that it would be taking on responsibility for the um, Patello Bridge um, project. Uh, we're hoping that the province gets, um, gets procurement started um, by the end of the second quarter of this year so that the new bridge can continue, we can continue to expect the new bridge to be um, available by uh, 2023. That new bridge will be a four-lane bridge with the ability to expand uh, someday in the future to six lanes uh, with, uh, with very good pedestrian and bike uh, facilities on the bridge as well. Uh, the province will deliver the project. Uh, once the new bridge is commissioned, then the province will take responsibility to demolish the existing um, structure. Um, we had a, a very uh, good announcement a number of weeks ago, joined by Mayor Moore uh, from Port Coquitlam on our B-Line um, program. Uh, we're very excited that we're moving forward with the first of the four B-Lines envisioned out of the 11 B-Lines in the 10-year plan. Uh, those four B-Lines are expected to be operational by the end of 2019. Uh, that's, uh, that will require 58 new articulated uh, coaches, all funded by, uh, by the 10-year vision. And what we're working on is really stepping up our game on, on B-Line. Uh, it's not just, it's not the existing B-Line that we have today. Uh, there is funding both in the Phase 1 plan and there is funding embedded in the proposed Phase 2 plan uh, to provide an even better experience, not just more frequent service using articulated coaches, but working very, very closely with each municipality that, that controls the right-of-way that we operate on to improve the speed and reliability of the service, as well as to provide a, very, a variety of other customer-focused um, uh, components, I would hope that we can, in fact, launch a different and better product going forward. You'll hear from Sarah Ross uh, later on in the program talking a little bit about the um, very, very good work that Sarah and Jeff have been doing. Um, I think at all of the city councils, they've now made uh, done their meetings uh, to brief them on the next steps uh, on the Beeline program. Uh, SkyTrain car uh, announcement. Uh, we had a great announcement at the Canada Line. Uh, operations and maintenance facility joined by uh, uh, the Premier. It was, uh, it was really delightful to have, uh, have him come and celebrate um, the procurement uh, and advancing of our SkyTrain network along with uh, Minister Robinson and Mayor Brody from uh, Richmond. The main portion of the announcement was that we were um, able to accelerate the procurement of additional cars for the Expo Millennium line uh, three years faster than expected. Again, we remain very, very focused on customer service. We remain very focused here, uh, as does this board, of course, and the mayors, on getting product out to our customers to relieve crowding, provide uh, more frequent service as quickly as possible. So by 2020, the system between Canada Line, Expo, Millennium lines will see 80 new cars um, arriving in the system. The first of those cars, uh, in fact, uh, remain on schedule. Uh, to date to, to arrive um, within the third quarter of this year in service by the fourth quarter and then we'll be rolling out that additional equipment uh, throughout the course of 2019 and into 2020. Uh, we also had a very successful pilot on our double-decker buses. Uh, you'll hear from Hayden Atchison uh, shortly um, about uh, the pilot and the next steps going forward uh, with the program. But we received significant um, public and customer positive response. And again, I think that's another um, indication of how we can drive the program forward to, to improve customer comfort, but really drive the market. We are providing additional capacity with those coaches uh, that is more comfortable and we think can help drive ridership in the suburban areas that so desperately need improved transit service. Uh, lastly, um, several weeks ago, we went out to market on what we call our card clash campaign in anticipation of beginning mobile payments um, in our system. Um, later in the spring, Steve Anagus will be providing a briefing to you um, on that. Uh, once we implement the mobile payments going forward where you can use your credit card or your mobile phone uh, to, to tap and go, if you will, in, in the system, we will uh, uh, make the system that much more available, uh, particularly for um, visitors and, and infrequent users of the system. So, in, uh, Madam Chair, that's the end of my remarks, but I think in toto, uh, represents, I, I think, a strong agenda of continuing to push our customer experience agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Are there any questions for Kevin in regards to his report before we move on to um, Richard Sykes? Any questions? 
Excellent report, lots of good exciting things happening. So I'm going to invite Richard up. Uh, Richard is here on behalf of Vivian King, who's the President and General Manager for BC Rapid Transit Company, which is essentially for the, um, the SkyTrain service. And Richard, welcome. Good morning all. Thank you. Trustworthy. <laughs> So this morning I'm going to give you some key highlights and some updates of what's been happening in the rail division for Q4 and year end of last year. Our first slide shows you our dashboard of our overall performance. It shows our on-time performance, our scheduled service delivery and our cut customer satisfaction and our mystery shopper. And I'm exceptionally uh, happy to report that on the Expo Millennium line we exceeded the targets. Uh, the West Coast Express while slightly down on their targets, they remained very high. The mystery shopper exceeded. We were hindered with uh, two failures on the West Coast Express, which caused us those minor uh, drops in numbers, is the truth. Uh, on December 29th, we had a threes in rain that brought down the overhead lines. And what that meant was we had to bring our last three trains uh, from uh, Pit Ma uh, Maple, sorry, from uh, Maple Meadows by bus into the end of the service line and that took us a little bit of time to get those buses out there. The customers uh, were all uh, very well perceived of that service, however that did hinder our, our overall KPIs. Uh, the other thing is we had two uh, loco failures. The good thing is with having two loco failures in 2016 there were six so we did reduce that by two thirds. Our next slide shows us our train service delays. During the last quarter uh, of 2017, we've enhanced how we report on our delays. We now have a graph that shows our 16 to 30 minutes and anything that's greater than 30 minutes. The chart on the left, you'll see that there is a huge yellow bar. That attributes to seven of our delays that impacted our passengers between 16 and 30 minutes. I'd like to emphasize what that really means. So these include things like slip, trips and falls, our intrusion device systems, uh, the jamming of doors and medical issues. The service delay on the right that shows the 30 minutes plus, there were two significant delays in November. One was caused by a power problem uh, with an electrical switch out of Columbia. And the second uh, was a track switch in the Edmonds area. We do detailed reporting now on anything that's greater, greater than 30 minutes and lessons learned to ensure that we learn from any delay that we have and then any recommendations we can take forward for improvement to our customers. Our next slide shows our business initiatives in line with our business plan, our key focus areas, our safety on our people, a state of good repair, mobilising the Mayor's vision and focusing on our improved customer experience and our public support. One, two, many. So we, during the last quarter, we launched our Safety First campaign. Uh, and what we did by that was heighten awareness to all of our staff, enhancing the strong safety culture that we have within the rail division. Uh, we recently launched our new messaging. It's very bold and very, very simple. Safety first. We want to heighten awareness and ensure that all of our employees and the staff and our customers are aware that safety is at the top of our mind in every instance. It was just a, a relaunch. We've hung some really last, uh, large posters around the network, certainly within all of the worksite areas. To give you some context, them, those displays that are up there are around 16 feet in length and 8 feet in depth. This will allow us to keep it at, at, you know, at our forefront of our minds. State of Good Repair, our second uh, overall business initiative. We had a great year in, from a maintenance perspective. We managed to finish, as planned, the Expo Line Rail Replacement Project. This was in a downtown corridor between Main and Waterfront, where we highlighted two years ago that this rail needed replacing. Continuing in a state of good repair, we replaced one of our incident reporting systems. We call it OpsLog internally. And what that really does is it allows us to map and track all of our incidents, whether they're safety related or whether they are an outstanding action or a recommendation from a report. This was key to us from an operations perspective. It now allows us to track the incidents from start 
from cradle to grave at the end of the day with a highlighting system that anything that focuses on greater than 25 days it will escalate through the manager through the director and into a VP to ensure we close out within the relevant timelines as set by others on top of that uh, we continued our infrastructure maintenance we've been doing very well with regarding pad replacement last year key highlights we, re we ground 114 kilometers of our railway to give you some context there's around 120 kilometers on the main line uh, some of that's tracks, uh, track switches that we don't grind every year and some of that's in some of the stations we replaced the 4.8 kilometers of running rail as said above and we're back out in Surrey uh, replacing over 16,000 rail pads between Surrey uh, sorry, Scott Road and King George. Our third focus area. So this is the uh, vehicle 29 of the accelerated 28 vehicles that Kevin mentioned earlier. That's the vehicle being built down in the USA. It's in a place called uh, Plattsburgh in New York State. And Bombardier are on target to deliver the first of their vehicles late summer this year uh, for use into passenger service in the fourth quarter. And new and improved customer experience, our last focus area. We celebrate the one year opening of the Evergreen Line on the 2nd of December, as Kevin mentioned. This has uh, contributed to our record ridership and our experience. It's been such a huge success for us at Skytrain and for us at Translink. Uh, we launched the Safety Awareness, uh, Winter's Coming for our customers, a campaign, slip, trips and falls, be careful, dark nights are coming. Uh, we had these put on stations on platform levels and down on concourse levels. It was received really well. And then Avro, our beloved Falcon, made international news um, at the end of the day. The purpose of the programme was to help with incidents and safety, to enhance cleanliness around the network, uh, help us with maintenance and the customer experience. We do have pigeons that fly into the guideway and trip our intrusion devices. It was all part of a deterrent from there very successful what we're doing is we're evaluating uh, the report from that and then we'll establish whether it's the right thing that we want to do going forward that's the end of my presentation Richard thank you very much Are there any questions for Richard in regards to his report Janet yeah, uh, not a question Richard but I just wanted to acknowledge um, the really marked improvement in the customer satisfaction uh, responses I think it's like 78 versus 73% last year. So that's that's not easy to do. Um, I think that's a pretty quick turnaround and you, you and your team deserve a lot of uh, uh, credit for that. And then also to acknowledge the um, excellent work I think that's been done on the winter preparedness. I think that's really across the system. Um, I know that's been a lot of work for you and I think it's absolutely the right direction to be going in. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jenny. Great. Thank you, Anne, and then Murray, and then Richard. Uh, it's a uh, important uh, endeavor to put safety first in all you do. I thank you for doing that. S those are big signs. Uh, the smaller signs, so how will you know that you're uh, attaining better safety? What, what's your plan? So on top of the, the campaign and on top of making things very visual, we've enhanced our toolbox talks. So at the end of the day, we're getting out to the frontline staff, whether that's with my counterpart, Mike Richard, or whether it's I in maintenance, or whether it's us in corporate services. We're ensuring that at the toolbox talks, they're very focused on safety. I open all of our meetings with a safety moment, and that can be anything from general. The other day, uh, we opened our <laughs> team meeting with just a, a view of, are people speeding within the car park? It just brings it to the forefront. With this toolbox talks, we are focusing on anything that happens on or about the railway from a customer perspective or from an incident that could be someone cutting a finger. So it's all focus, whether it's for a supervisor's meeting, safety meeting, manager's meeting, or a direct reports meeting. And is there a culture where people are um, encouraged to intervene if they observe a potentially unsafe act? Very much so. One of the things that certainly Vivian brought to the forefront is if you walk past something that you think that is unsafe, then it's acceptable to you. And what we've done is rolled that out across the whole of the business saying, if you need to know or you're unsure, then raise it as a safety concern. It's easy to stop. It's not so easy to restart, but to make sure everyone is safe, people on the top of a ladder or someone working on the track is just as critical. Great. Well, we'll be looking at your safety stats and hoping to see uh, a good, good improvement. So thank you. Thanks, Anne. 
Thank you, uh, Murray. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, I'm, I'm springing this on you a bit, so if you don't have the information, that's fine. Okay. You can send it later. But uh, the uh, the noise complaints that were um, brought forward to the board by delegations and the, a study that was initiated to address those noise complaints in relation to SkyTrain operations. How is that progressing? Is it on schedule? Um, the uh, uh, is there uh, an ongoing dialogue with those people who are uh, concerned? And um, any other information that you may be able to provide? I think there's a man over there wanting to be for me. You can, please. So the, um, that we we we're into that process now. We've been doing, I think, some fairly considerable um, public. Um, work actually, Sandy's group is running um, the project. We've put together, I think, what it's it's a sort of a stakeholder group, as well as doing surveys out in the system. I think we'd shown um, the board uh, probably last quarter uh, the scope of, of the inquiry that we're taking. So we're in the information collection, um, public um, information collection phase at this point in time. I would expect we'll be coming back to the board, I believe, in June at least with an interim report. Uh, based on the findings on the um, on the public consultation, and then from there we will then through Sandy's group on the engineering side, working very very closely, of course, with Richard and and his folks, begin to identify a menu probably of different options that could be taken from small, medium, all the way to very significant <laughs> actions that might be warranted. Is that more or less accurate? <laughs> Stay engaged with uh, those people who have uh, concerns about it and to uh, ensure that they uh, know that action is continuing. Thanks. No, I think that's an excellent question, and I get questioned about that often from people in my network that are saying it's pretty noisy on the train sometimes. So, uh, so I think noise pollution is a big, big issue and important for us. So, thanks for bringing that to our attention, Richard. Oh, thank you. Uh, your comments were segueing into just a quick question. I'm assuming that the grinding of rails is, is about noise. Uh, in some instances, yes. And in other instances? Uh, it was the, the, the rail pipe replacement. We resumed the work uh, back at Scott Road and I knew the day before and we never made the public aware. That's correct in the following day. I'm still, you grind rails for noise, it seems to me, I don't think any of us ever saw a rail that looked worn. So what um, What other reason would you ever grind any rails apart from noise? Is, is it? It keeps it in state, it could be better. It ensures the short hardness of the rail stays in, the, okay. in that context. And it also gives me a rail profile yeah. that requires that the wheel rail noise ratio. Okay, but ultimately it's more about noise than it is about safety. It's about both keeping it in the state, it could okay. be and ensuring I get a whole life cycle out of the rail. Does a of things. There is a around noise, but a so rails wear out. Oh, that does wear out. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not a railway guy, so I, I don't know. But okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Richard. And just note your microphone's not on, Sarah. Well, my question was about rail grinding as well and noise. Uh, Richard, you said you did 114 kilometers of grinding this year, uh, and you gave us context. Sorry, but the amount of grinding you did this year, and you gave us context and how long the system is. But how how much does that compare to years you've done in the past? And then is the new you're getting a new rail grinder, I believe, in the capital program. Is that in addition, or is that to replace the one that you had that was fairly that's been around for a while? It's mature, <laughs> mature, <laughs> seasoned. <laughs> It has been around for a while, so a, very, a long while. Uh, it is part of a re capital replacement program for uh, state of good repair to ensure that we have modern day equipment. Um, the 114 kilometres is what I've tried to establish over the last three years. We try to get to the whole of the railway. The plan is I will do a minimum of one third. Not all of the rail is at the same standard. Not all of the rail is in the same wear pattern. So to keep the maximum life out of it, I'll grind it from that perspective. Just back up, Richard, and to uh, Mayor Walton's. It is a bit of an art. You have to find the right. It's not just the machine. It's the right person and the <laughs> right profile, and it takes a lot of trial and error. So nice, Start nice work. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken from a true hockey player. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Well, Richard, I think that's all. Thank you very much for uh, coming and sharing that information. And we did all read your report in advance, so uh, very good information for us. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank Have you. Have a great Easter.
All right, and with that, then I'm going to invite Hayden Ashison up. And Hayden, I think, just came back from a vacation, so he's looking pretty relaxed. Yeah. Except I picked up the flu bug, but anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> Too many hours on an airplane. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it's nice to see you. Uh, thanks. Good. Good morning. Good morning to those of you who I haven't met yet. Cover five. <clears throat> I've got my water with me. I've got my meds with me. me <laughs> Hopefully, you don't need to go to the medication oh, department. <laughs> so, highlights of uh, the last quarter. I'd like to start with the double decker <clears throat> trial. Uh, exciting uh, for us. When we initially talked about a double decker trial, it was going to be one month, or uh, sorry, one bus for uh, three months. Uh, we talked to the manufacturer. They gave us two buses at no charge, four month trial. Four months really allowed us a good opportunity to put it on our highway routes to do a lot of testing, get a lot of feedback from our uh, customers. I'll share uh, some of that with you. And really an opportunity for a bit of our skeptical maintenance folks uh, to have something new come into the system. Uh, they were skeptical at the beginning. I was out at uh, Richmond uh, yesterday, met with the uh, maintenance manager just to get uh, updated for our meeting today and he admitted to me he was skeptical and today he's a proponent of it and, and certainly from the maintenance perspective I recommend uh, the double decker just a terrific uh, bus for us uh, during our, our trials. <clears throat> so the trial uh, started mid-November went to uh, March uh, 15th it just wrapped up. Uh, the seating capacity 80 to 86 seats uh, depending on the configuration which is 50 percent more than our current Orion uh, buses on that uh, route. Uh, we did a lot of uh, evaluating uh, for customer experience on our feedback impact operations and maintenance and infrastructure requirement changes which will uh, be proposed for the uh, Richmond Centre. Uh, there's the routes uh, that we uh, tried them on. Uh, the 601 uh, was one that we wanted to integrate right from uh, the beginning but we had problems with low hanging wires, um, cable and hydro. Uh, we spent a lot of effort uh, and working with uh, the city of uh, Delta to get those wires removed, but it took a long time at the end. <clears throat> we had three days that we were able to, to, to test it on the others. We had some uh, really good uh, opportunities to test it at peak times and uh, good feedback uh, from everybody on that. The focus of these routes is uh, long, the long distance routes uh, with fewer stops where the average customer trip time is 40 uh, minutes long. Many of the routes uh, currently experience overcrowding, especially at the peak periods. A nice little graphic by our comms people on, on some of the uh, comments of, of customers. We heard a lot of positive uh, feedback from our customers, probably five to one, six to one on, on the comments. The negatives weren't really uh, that negative, just more observations. Uh, we heard from over 600 uh, customers, so a great uh, response back, both from uh, written surveys and online. We're still getting uh, results in, which we'll include in our final report, but they're, they're tracking 5 to 1, 6 to 1, 7 to 1 on favorability. Some of the comments uh, from our customers, they appreciated the increased capacity and comfort. They said it was a very smooth ride, and in particular, uh, those who commute to work and who have laptops said they really appreciate features such as power plugs and USB ports and the overhead lights. That was a, a big feature that we heard over and over and over again. They actually got on the bus. They didn't have to stand getting on in White Rock. They sat down, they opened their laptop and then we got a lot of good feedback on that. I'll share with you a <clears throat> few of the negatives. Uh, taller customers felt the upper deck ceiling was low and it is low. Uh, not enough room for luggage on ferry routes. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, it's the same customers on our side that's on BC Transit and BC Transit customers don't complain, and it's probably just uh, sort of the just the nature of, of the business. We we will look at more uh, luggage rack facilities on it, but in our discussion with BC Transit, they really just don't have the complaints. A handrail didn't extend uh, far enough off. I, I asked our maintenance manager yesterday, just what does that mean? And I guess it was it only goes three quarters of the way up, and that's an easy one for us to put in our our order. more feedback. Uh, internally, both operationally and uh, maintenance, 
uh, drivability, power braking, funding of, of the buses rated very high by our operators. Uh, loading, unloading times a, a little bit higher, of course, due to the uh, upper deck. That's why these buses are more suited to highway than stop and starts in, in the city. Uh, fuel economy, surprisingly a little better than our articulated 60-foot uh, uh, buses. Uh, route and reroute testing, uh, critical. Uh, the operators tell us that when we put it on new routes, we need to spend a lot of time with them. Things just come up that we never uh, thought of uh, on, on the routes, and so they really encouraged us to spend the time uh, looking at the routes and, and doing some testing. Uh, bus is easy to maintain. Pre-engineering uh, work at the uh, depots uh, were quite easy to, uh, to adjust. Uh, the infrastructure costs overall uh, for maintenance as they have to replace uh, the hoist. These are 27, 28,000 pound uh, buses. Our buses are about 22,000 hoists are limited at, at 25,000. So the infrastructure change over three years would be a cost of about eight a million dollars, minus the fact that our hoist at Richmond, not to get too technical, but our hoist at Richmond have, have reached their life cycle end anyhow, and a big part of that uh, would, uh, replacing the cost would be offset by that in, in any event. Um, the maintenance folks said it's, they're relatively easy uh, to work on. <clears throat> I was told, and I'm just going to, this is third hand, but from the maintenance manager, he told me he was concerned that a low riding bus generally, the lower a, a bus rides the ground, the passenger sit on the ground, the rougher the ride. These buses particularly were smooth and he said it's because it's built on a fire engine frame. Very, very solid frame and that's why we've got such good customer feedback on a smooth ride even on the lower floor. So just a little factoid for you. Uh, our Orions, which is our highway buses, are coming to the life and we went to the Mayor's uh, Council in the end of uh, December uh, for funding to replace uh, 50 of the 75 Orions, which have come to the end of their life cycle. Uh, in, in that request, we uh, put a tentative uh, a number of 32 uh, double-deckers uh, for that funding. The RFP has gone out in March for uh, the buses. The double-decker 32 that we put in is easily convertible back to regular 40-foot uh, uh, coaches. Uh, going forward. We've done our uh, uh, midterm interim report which is really the significant part of it. Uh, the recommendation from the bus company to the fleet steering committee is to go ahead with the purchase of the double-decker buses for all the reasons that I've outlined. It's a great customer uh, fund and from our perspective it's uh, we're, we, we welcome it into our system. Uh, next slide is our fleet update uh, for 2018. I'm told it's our largest delivery since the Olympics at uh, 210 buses. Significant, of course, is 106 CNG buses that are going into the Surrey Transit Centre. And as you recall from previous presentations, we spent last year installing a CNG fueling facility at Surrey. It is now up and running and certified. The first two buses uh, go into Surrey in the next couple of weeks and the remainder will come in throughout the year. So exciting about that. Our other 104 uh, hybrids will be split between the Hamilton and the Vancouver uh, centers, and they'll be coming in uh, July through uh, December. A uh, handy dark transition, the purpose of this slide is really, the thesis is a seamless transition as we change contractors from uh, MV to first uh, transit. We are halfway through the transition period uh, January to June. It starts uh, with First Transit on uh, July 1st. Uh, we have a couple of steering committees, a working uh, steering committee uh, that uh, is on every element of the transition. We also have an executive steering committee uh, that I chair with the respective VPs from both uh, MV and First Transit. We had a call yesterday. Louise was on the call with me. We are on track uh, for the transition. Uh, things, uh, I understand all the elements and and everything has uh, is, is, uh, been going well. Uh, little ups and downs uh, here and there, but for the most part going uh, very well. Uh, First Transit will be put a, putting on a forum in May for uh, customers to meet and discuss the service and their expectations. We're very pleased that they're doing. And something uh, going forward which is unique and built into the contract with uh, First Transit, and I think in later uh, meetings with the board, Louise uh, will outline it. We have 20 performance standards now built into the contract to ensure that we uh, deliver a good service to the customers. Missed trips, late trips, holding times, 
at, at the call center. Uh, very pleased that those uh, performance incentives are in there and it gives us a real opportunity uh, to hold our contractor accountable uh, for that type of performance. So we're really very pleased that that went, went into the contract. I put this slide up, I uh, always would like to put an environmental piece in, very proud of that. Uh, this slide looks busy, really all you're looking at is the delta uh, of the difference of the two and that is with the uh, retrofit uh, that was done at uh, Richmond that I've mentioned before both in, uh, on heating and electrical uh, consumption. Uh, the delta represents a 29% uh, reduction now uh, since the changes have been put in place. We expect to save 60000 a year in electrical costs, 35000 a year in natural uh, gas, retrofits are being done with funding from both BC Hydro and with Fortis. Uh, next on our list is the uh, Vancouver uh, Transit Centre, much more complicated one uh, that I'm told, but uh, we're very pleased that the initial uh, numbers coming in are what we <laughs> thought, in fact, they've exceeded what we initially uh, put in, so we're very pleased about that. And uh, finally, <clears throat> to leave on a very positive tone, we had our, our core work safe audit uh, once again. Uh, this year, uh, we uh, passed the uh, minimum 80% re requirement with scores of 82 and 86%. Uh, uh, very uh, pleased with that. That's another uh, consecutive year that we've made it. Results in a 15% uh, rebate in annual premiums. I'm told that could be around $1.3 to $1.4 million. So always good to end my presentation on a, on a positive note of money coming into the system. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Hayden, thank you very much. Okay. I think the closing of a safety focus is a very thank good you. closing. <laughs> yes. But on that note, you're not off the hot seat yet. I think some directors probably have a few questions for you. So, Murray, we'll start with Murray and then on to Janet. Uh, thanks, Lorraine. Um, thanks, Hayden. Good, good presentation. Just uh, on the uh, double-decker buses, um, you weren't explicit in this regard, but I'm assuming that the bottom line business case is it's um, on certain routes, they ultimately will be cheaper to operate per passenger mile than the alternatives we have available. Or, uh, supplementary to that, uh, better customer experience combined with that. Is that am I? I think that's pretty accurate. I mean, it, it is cheaper, uh, but the customer feedback, uh, the overcrowding, uh, being able to put 90 seats uh, every time a bus pulls up to a stop, uh, that's a big part of it as well. So, one the, one of, Murray, one of the, um, that, that I think Hayden, um, has in their uh, customer survey data, I don't remember what the number is, but a fairly significant number of the people surveyed indicated because of this bus, they would be more likely to ride transit more often. So, the um, so it's it's a customer experience, but it's also a, a way to attract more ridership. You know, in these highway corridors, those are the same highways that are filled with cars and congested byways. So the more we can do to attract and retain additional customers, that's our mission going forward. So you've got this sort of triple win uh, with, with the program. So for the customers that are slogging through the slightly less comfortable buses now and the more crowded buses, they get a better um, experience and that's a way to then market the routes as well and get more riders on those on those routes. Interesting, Julie, uh, met with Julie yesterday, she was telling me that they were getting many, many calls from customers wanting to know when the double decker was going to be on that. They wanted to wait for that. What time is it going to be at that, uh, at that bus stop? And uh, so, uh, so just a, a supplementary question. And <clears throat> the, uh, the issue of um, headroom in this, on the second level, um, how, how much difference I is it between the first level and the second level? I think it's about four to Dave, Dave Grubelski. Do you know Dave? That Dave's our project manager on, yeah. you know what the difference was between BC Transit and ours on the ceiling height? Yeah. Maybe about four no. inches? Or, is that what you mean? I'm, 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 I'm just talking about the headroom. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed yeah. that. First floor and second floor? So, <laughs> remember, we needed that four inches to get under the tunnel as well. That's why I, I was focused on that. Because right. we're so, different than BC Transit by about four inches at the top. Right. So, I guess the uh, it comes back to that issue of safety and, and uh, you know, that 5'7 isn't very high you know, the average height of the population, I don't know what it is, but is there a, is there a recommended approach when we get the double-decker buses to ensuring that people are aware that they may bump their head if they stand up? Well, there's no standing allowed when we're driving the bus upstairs. That's that's part of the rule. There's, I mean, to get there's to video cameras, sure. I mean, I, I think there is a there, there is a piece there that we, we need to be cognizant of, of sort of teaching our customers and awareness and, and those things. But I mean, right, it's a right. very good point. I agree all with right, it. Thank it's you. a good point. 
short people only going upstairs. <laughs> uh, Janet? Uh, yeah, so congratulations on the pilot. Um, I just had one uh, question really, which is about the stability of the buses with the extra height. So I know they're really more long distance route, but I wondered if um, if that was an issue, if your, if your drivers identified that as an issue at all. And we all thought that. that yeah. we, we all thought that there was going to be a lot of swaying, and there isn't. And, and I think that very solid frame, as I it's mentioned earlier, was the reason for it. Frame. Yeah. And, and the bus does sit very, very low to, to lower it down, but no, that's not something yeah. we... And that was something I remember operators asked us about. They, yeah. People were going to get sick up there or whatever. So it was good design. And then I had another one, really. is um, Looking at your key performance indicators, um, you know, we seem to be tracking pretty well with respect to year over year. But what I found interesting was looking at your employee lost time accident frequency, you have reduced that almost a half over last year. So to what do you attribute that? Is that partly weather conditions last year? Um, is it the safety emphasis that we've had this Well, I, I really had a sigh of relief when I saw that because I reported to the board for a number of quarters that that big spike up was due to the winter uh, of last year, and, and so I was always nervous when this came through. In fact, yesterday we just got our February numbers. Kevin hasn't seen it yet, and we're trending down even more. So, yes, I, I think it confirms it was last year's winter. Thank you, and 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 uh, all our safety numbers uh, for February are, are showing a, a good trend. So really pleased about that. Mm -hmm. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Jim. Um, Hayden, in your written report, you mentioned the all door boarding pilot, and uh, obviously it makes lots of sense to get people on the bus. Uh, do you have any early sense of whether people are getting on and not paying and not tapping? That's a very good. That's that's a very good question. Uh, we're good there. I understand we're going to we're doing some comparisons. We've got uh, sort of uh, monitoring going out there to compare. We think there's a little bit, but not a lot. But I'll have better data for you next time around. That is something we're evaluating, for right. sure. Yeah. Okay. And then of the people that don't pay, um, I just wonder. You know, sometimes the problem people on buses or transit, and is there a correlation between people that don't pay and being problems for other customers and for the driver? So it's just a thought. Okay. Comment. I'm not aware of that that correlation. I know customers that do pay get very upset with customers that don't pay and make sure the operator knows that. We, we get that information all the time. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to go to Anne and then after that, Tony. Thank you. Thanks for your report. Um, uh, I was curious about the uh, experience with the double-decker buses and the overhanging wires from hydro and cable. Uh, I assume there is there a regulatory requirement about the height that they have to be at uh, first. Secondly, are there safety implications if a bus encounters one of these? And thirdly, uh, who bears the cost of w raising them? I'm not sure about uh, the cost. Certainly, it's a safety issue if, if if we come in contact with them. And I'm not sure what the regulatory height is. Certainly, when we did our testing and we did our prototype uh, bus out there, there were low-hanging wires that have been there for a while. I know, Dave, do you have some, some input on that? When you sit, stand up. So I would assume there'll be some sort of program to keep an eye on those wires going yes. forward when these buses yes. become part of our system. Thank you. And we'll decide, and we'll, if we do go ahead with the order, we get the order, that we won't end up with 32 buses on day one. So we'll pick which routes and we'll, it'll give us a lot of opportunity to, to be very proactive and lots of opportunity to get get the wires raised. Thank you. Yes. Nobody wants anybody to talk today, but Kevin's off, off limits. <laughs> <laughs> You've had enough. Oh, it works. Here, you, you're pressing the wrong button. Come on, we want you to talk. <laughs> I, I was just going to add, when, when we started the pilot, uh, you know, the pilot um, came kind of quickly. Uh, so I think this gives us now, between now and the delivery of the buses, plenty of time to work with the jurisdictions and the power companies. Uh, and Well, first to inspect the corridors and the routes and then work with whoever is responsible for those wires uh, to rectify any, any wires that are out of compliance. Um, clearly, we would not operate the buses um, on those corridors if the wires remain out of compliance and the entity responsible for them did not correct the problem. Okay, Tony. 
Uh, morning, Hayden. This is just a small item, but sometimes these small items are important to our customers. So I noticed that there's a, uh, a program where the taxi drivers are, are wearing vests, and I know this was an issue that was raised at previous meetings by our customers in terms of knowing who their taxi driver was. So is the plan to maybe extend that to all our taxi drivers? or Louise? I'll get Louise to answer that. Okay, thank you. The plan was to do the trial for six months and see how, the, how positive the customer feedback is. We have our contractor doing daily phone calls to the customers who have been on those two taxis, and it's been all favor favorable so far. So we, we do have the budget to roll it out system-wide, um, but we'll make that decision closer to the end of the six months. Great, thank you. Thanks, Louise. Any other? Karen? Yeah, um, Hayden, thanks for your report. Excellent. I just had a, a quick question about LED lighting. And um, aside from the cost savings, are you get, do you feel like you're getting the same amount of lighting or have you had to install additional lighting to kind of keep the same level of lighting? I know Derek's here, so I, I, I won't guess on it, Derek. Uh, so the LED lighting is um, probably more efficient and we're actually able to draw the lighting levels in many cases, although we haven't due to the spectrum Yeah, because the, the safety issue is obviously the big, the big key. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Good Thank you, you, Hayden. I think we're, we've exhausted all our questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. So I'd like to invite uh, Chief uh, Doug Lepard up to join us, and we're going to talk about our transit police. Welcome. So, uh, just a few minutes today, so I'll try and keep it tight. So, just talk about a couple of things that initiatives from the last quarter of last year and coming into this year. So, first thing I want to talk about is the restructuring of our general investigation unit. So, it's quite a different mandate when I arrived, but thanks to the support from this board, we got some new staff for 2018 and we used two of those new police officers to increase our general investigation unit from eight to ten. And that was important for us because before they were just working four days on, three days off, really were not able to provide uh, the level of support to our patrol officers that we wanted them to, and also to get right on top of investigations that needed to have rapid follow-up that couldn't wait uh, for three days, you know, if it needed some expert follow-up. So we now have two units uh, rather than one unit of uh, eight we have two units of five uh, so they cover seven days a week they are aligned with our patrol shifting pattern so the patrol members get to know them better and know that they're there to support them uh, it allows for a rapid follow-up on what we call front-end loading of serious crime investigations for example you've probably seen the media coverage of the serious assault that occurred a few days ago on a bus in surrey so it's one where we've pulled out all the stops, not only in terms of the general investigation unit members, but coordinating the work of patrol officers in support of that well as well, because there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and in front of the scenes on that. Um, the mandate I mentioned, you know, there was more a focus on offender management and some surveillance, uh, which just really didn't provide the return on investment that I wanted to see. So much more focused on doing an excellent job of following up on those cases that patrol members don't have the capacity for, but also in supporting investigative excellence throughout the organization by overseeing the investigations of patrol members and providing guidance and support and so on. And one of the things that we did in support of that, uh, we completed uh, at the end of last year was all our frontline members, 121 of them that we got to received a five-day best practices interviewing uh, course. And that's a very important skill for all police officers. Um, so that went very well. 
Well, I'd, so I just thought you might be interested in a little, like, how does it all work, and so an anatomy of an investigation. So this is a tweet that you may or may not have seen. Um, Sniffing dogs been on the trains uh, the past two weeks. It sounds like that there was more than there was. But here's what happened: is that on January 8th, uh, West Coast Express contacted us and said, "Look, there's been a note that we're worried about. It's been left on a train." We looked at the note. It was actually uh, um, directions on how to build a sophisticated bomb. So there wasn't a threat in it, but the threat was implied. Obviously, a lot of concern created by that. Uh, so we took some proactive preventative measure. Uh, measures and then we communicated that information out through the real-time intelligence center ARTEC which is a provincial unit uh, that all police share in disseminate information to and, and receive information from on a very rapid basis uh, we made contact with the integrated national security investigation team run by the RCMP is the ter terrorism if there was some aspect of that that's in their mandate we consulted with the RCMP's explosive dis uh, disposal unit in terms of the, this recipe for the bomb um, and on uh, January 10th uh, so just a couple of days later as a result of that information that we disseminated through Arctic we got a call from the Richmond RCMP telling us we've just found a note in a Richmond mall and it looks exactly like what you've described we looked at it and in fact it it was so a little bit of a needle in a haystack is now we've got two very disparate points of contact but what we do have is video in both locations and you wouldn't think that we'd be able to identify it but we looked at video from both locations at approximately the right times and we actually did spot a person who appeared in both locations on the dates in question and we found the needle in the haystack uh, so as soon as we saw that video that took us uh, about eight days to do that January 18th we, had, we saw the video, same guy in two different places of concern. We put out stills of that through Arctic again, uh, and including to our members, and within hours of disseminating that information, our transit police members found him riding the transit system, arrested him, brought him in, where he uh, confessed to our general investigation members. So it was, uh, it was a good result, and then we disseminated that information. Like I say, there were no charges, there was no specific threat. Uh, there is an explanation that I won't go into, but it was good to practice that and to resolve and determine that that wasn't a threat. Um, picture of the film. Uh, one of the other things that we did last year in November is we ran two tabletop exercises for both sides of the shifting of our organization, and that was to practice for a critical incident. Um, it involved us, CMBC, BCRTC, uh, BPD, RCMP, CN Police, others. Uh, so lots of stakeholders involved. Uh, it was the first time that this uh, exercise information system tool had been used in Canada. Uh, it's a TSA tool. We have a great relationship with all our American counterparts. We belong to an organization that includes TSA, transit police agencies uh, in the U.S. and England. Uh, the FBI and, and so on, so good contacts were able to use that. It was a great learning experience for our sergeants and uh, it was in preparation for a live exercise that I'll tell you about next. 25 page report produced with a bunch of recommendations that we're following up on. So the next thing that's going to happen is that you all know water frustration, it's a major multimodal hub. Uh, for transportation and we are going to be running a live uh, scenario there April 16th and April 18th. It's in, in conjunction with West Coast Express who are actually required by Transport Canada to run uh, such exercises so we're partnering with them. Again it involves BCRTC, CNBC, BPD, uh, BC Ambulance, uh, others. Um, I won't tell you the details because it has to be a surprise to everybody but it's a high risk scenario and it uh, assumes that VPD ERT emergency response team is tied up on another major incident and so transit police have to manage this scenario so that will build on our tabletop exercise and other training that we have been doing with our members around critical incidents and I'll just finish with um, just some metrics so you see property crime has been trending down since 2012 but crimes against persons trended up from 2010 to 2015 so very pleased to see the crimes against persons rate went down in 2016 and again in 2017 as a rate per 100,000 boarded passengers. 
And one of the ways that we make people safer, it's not the only way, there are many ways, but uh, we take bad actors out of the system. And you can see there was a very significant increase in people we arrested on criminal arrest warrants uh, 2017 compared to 2016, and the increase from 2015 to 2016 was also similar in that, uh, as well, we arrested about 659 people on new charges for new offenses, uh, mischief, assault, sexual assault, robbery, and so on. And then uh, I'll just finish with, uh, since Clayton, uh, Hayden got to finish with something really exciting and positive, uh, I just got this uh, <laughs> stats this morning as one of, we track a lot of different things, so one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is investigative excellence, particularly around one of our priorities, which is sex offending. And so our solve rate increased in 2016 and increased again in 2017. And we also compared, well, how are we doing in terms of charges we recommend to Crown Council, because this is a charge approval province where Crown has to approve charges, not the police like in other provinces some other provinces and uh, our charge approval success rate on sex offenses uh, increased by 16% in 2017 compared to 2016. So that is just a reflection of the focus we've put on it in terms of new training, policy, accountability mechanisms and so on. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, questions for Doug? Oh my goodness, it's such an excellent report. All right, well, hearing none, thank you very much. Good, thank you. Good job. Um, we're going to um, do one more report and then we're going to take a short break. And I'm going to invite Jeff Cross up to do his update on phase two for the 10 year vision. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome, board members. Uh, so I'll build on some of the earlier points that Kevin raised uh, today. So obviously we're uh, very excited to be moving forward on the Phase 2 plan. This is something uh, people should be starting to get familiar with is our dashboard, and we have a version that's easier to read online as well. Uh, so for quite some time we've been talking about delivering the plan in three phases. Uh, so now that center column is what uh, we will be going out and consulting on now that the key pieces around funding are in place. Uh, it's very significant. Uh, the first plan had a, a very rapid rollout of bus services, um, some preparation for the major projects, and some upgrades, uh, but it was kind of evenly split between operations and capital. This plan has a, a lot of very significant long-term capital um, investments in it, so it's um, probably over 80% capital oriented. But what it does is it allows us to stay on schedule, so it in fact advances some of that. We will be implementing years four and five of the plan for all of those categories that you see around bus service, CBUS, uh, handy dart expansion, kind of keeping the same trajectory that we had in the first um, three years and actually even accelerating that in the case of the bus service. Uh, the road uh, spending, the cycling and walking investments that have been very successful in year one uh, working with the municipalities. There's two more years of funding on that. There's also things like our new mobility services. Those investments are, are all part of this. So we're staying on the trajectory and we'll be funded halfway through that. And uh, as Kevin noted, two thirds of the way through the actual bus service that was outlined in the mayor's vision. Importantly, very significant upgrades to the Expo Millennium Line. Uh, Millennium Line is starting to catch up to Expo Line in terms of the development around it. It's taken some time, it's a newer line, uh, but with the extension into Coquitlam and all the work that's happening uh, in Burnaby around the stations, the development, we're seeing explosive growth there. So being able to get the fleet out and being able to serve that when people are making um, very important decisions of where they're living and working, uh, we want to make sure that we're able to have the, the um, uh, peak capacity and all the background systems to be able to support that. Expo line has always been very solid. Uh, most of the candle line expansion that was required for at least the first 10 years was in the phase one investment plan and that's underway. So we will be going out and consulting on this in similar fashion that we did in the phase one investment plan. Uh, I'll give the schedule later on, but it's coming later in April. 
The <laughs> format that we used in the phase one investment plan, I think, was was very successful and, and received well by both our stakeholders and the public, was to really provide a uh, a detailed map and a promise, almost a contract, if you will, about what we'll be providing, especially as that relates to the bread and butter that is the bus services. So we will be producing sub-regional maps that identify all of the prospective pro uh, projects uh, that we'll be uh, outlining, when those would come into effect in 2020 or 2021. Um, and, and talking about what the need is. So we're able to use Compass Card now and we're able to uh, look at our bus reliability measures and we're able to identify where those services we believe will be needed. We'll always be holding back a little bit because that's three years away for where some of the overcrowding elements are. The phase one plan focused highly on reliability and overcrowding as well as some new service areas. With this investment plan, we were, are proposing to be able to work on some other elements, span of service, uh, increasing frequency uh, in other areas where development is coming along and trying to match that. So it gives us some more levers to be able to support the municipalities in their objectives on this. You'll see on the map too, and we'll be describing, there's two thick uh, yellow bands or orange bands, one uh, connecting Richmond into the Expo line and one along Scott Road. Those were two B lines that were identified in the phase one investment plan for pre-planning. And so we're starting that now. These will be thus funded uh, in this plan. So that would put seven of the 12 uh, B lines in place by 2022, which is uh, a Herculean effort by not just us, but by the municipalities and the Ministry of Transportation. And this would be, I think now, 13 different municipalities that would be involved to, to make sure that these are, are successful. We'll also be identifying um, where some of the principles are for the regional cycling um, and walking to transit efforts as well. The funding piece, this was um, a, a major uh, undertaking, being that it's capital and operating. Uh, the province and the federal government are contributing uh, roughly 40% of the capital for most of the items in the plan. The province for all of the capital items. There are some elements for the uh, federal government that are non-transit that they are not involved in, uh, and some elements such as land that are not eligible categories for them. But uh, you can see what the breakdown is as what's proposed. There are still final approvals on the major projects required from both the, the province and the federal government that will fine-tune the exact numbers, but those are anticipated before the final plan comes forward for your approval. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, it's, rough, it's about $7 billion over 10 years. That's about $6 billion of capital and about a billion dollars of 10 years worth of additional operating uh, revenues. And we've been obviously publishing what the proposed revenue sources are. We are fine-tuning these and this will come forward in the consultation guide at the end of the month, what this will look like. Uh, the 2% the fare increase, we'll be working with the Joint Finance Committee on exactly how we would propose to be doing that. Roughly, it works out on a single uh, fare of somewhere between 5 and 15 cents, depending upon the product and how many zones you are going. Uh, that will also apply to our monthly pass programs. Uh, the parking sales tax rate going from 21 to 24%. Uh, the uh, uh, property tax is uh, fairly straightforward. It's set at a mill rate across the region, so on an average household, that's about 550. Why there's a range on the development cost charge, there's still a little bit of work to be done on a couple of options. Uh, the range is dependent upon whether it's an apartment, a townhouse, or a single home. It is, um, it's the same across the region as what's proposed, but we are looking at a couple of different options and consulting with the development sector to provide guidance to you and to the mayors uh, for final decisions before we go to the consultation and then hear what the public has to say during that period. So during the public consultation, we'll obviously uh, be consulting on this, on all of the services, all of the major capital. So anything that's 50 million or more, you'll be identifying what it is and when it is uh, being spent. So the major projects obviously will be a key focus on that, the rapid transit and otherwise. Uh, April 30th will be our launch of consultation. Uh, we'll be running two weeks. Uh, basically the same sort of approach that we did uh, for the phase one investment plan where we believe most uh, 
probably 90 or 95 percent of the input will be received online. I believe we had roughly 4,000 people participate in phase one. Uh, I would imagine it may be even more given the scope of some of the projects and the major projects that are underway. Uh, we'll use other mechanisms whereby we'll be out in each subregion, making sure that we're going to places where people are, uh, and we'll also be advertising this through online and through print to make sure that we're garnering uh, sufficient input for you to be able to hear what uh, people's reactions are to all the individual services, et cetera, and staff will then come back with recommendations uh, for any changes to the plan in late May for you uh, to sit, stay on schedule for a late June uh, adoption, which will allow us to go to procurement right on the heels of that. Uh, these are the uh, actual in-person events that we are planning and we have holds on now. So as I mentioned, we try and go to where people are as opposed to asking them to come to us and have a very specific event. So we'll try and make sure we're doing these at times and places where there's a lot of um, uh, activity happening. So with that, I'll take any questions, Chair. Jeff, thank you very much. Larry. Um, Jeff, have we done any estimates of the number of employees that, uh, workers that will be involved in the capital program uh, we're working on that, and as we fine-tune that with the, the business cases that are just um, being finalized with the provincial government and the federal government, when we come out, that will include all the years of, of employment, et cetera. It's very significant. It's in the tens of thousands. And, and secondly, um, are you getting ahead, and maybe this may be more to Sunny, are you getting ahead of the availability of, uh, of people to do the work, construction people, and et cetera? How are you, what are you doing about that? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Richard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate the uh, locations. I think those are, you know, based on my knowledge, and they're, are, it's good to go to and, and actually find people who are just going about doing something else, and then all of a sudden may take an interest in uh, an increased number of people. I, I, I'm very pleased about that. Um, I know that from the past, the past times that we've consulted, People certainly in the North Shore are very glad to have the opportunity, those who track transit, to come down and comment. The question I, I have is a general question, though, and that is that given the fact we have a fairly advanced detailed plan, uh, we're going out to save the public, you know, how do you, how do you what's missing, what's here, etc. Realistically, uh, when the public do come out and they do pass comments here, uh, to what extent is, is there's plan still open uh, for, for tweaking, um, or is this more for explaining? Because I've been asked that question a number of times. We are required to do this by legislation, and it's, it's, it's good that it's in legislation. And the fact that we do it, I think we do it well. So the issue isn't on, on uh, uh, you know, how we pr present it there. But I think that you know, the, the, the question is, uh, when you go out and consult on a plan, we get sometimes as local governments, we really get criticized heavily for going out and consulting on a plan when the plan's already, for the most part, set. So I just put the question to, you know, as a, as a general board question, as to so the public has some sense. And I don't mean to land you the question. It could be a Kevin or Jeff question. Uh, it's fair, fair point, Mayor Walton. In this particular case, I think it's a combination from an informed to consult, depending upon some of the projects have been in the works, and we've consulted on them for many years. And in that which case, uh, we want to be, we need to, by legislation and good practice, be able to report back to you levels of support, uh, where people are on the particular revenue sources. Uh, if And I think those are open if you chose to make tweaks to those. Uh, that could come back to the board and the mayors if you were hearing something very specific about one of the revenue sources, et cetera, that's still very open. What we also find is people are very interested in the bus services. And when we start looking at that, though, you know, understanding how we prioritize that, are there tweaks to those? 
those happen at number of levels. They happen through the investment plan intake process and then after the fact when we do design. So it's very important. It's raising awareness and then things that we'll have to follow up on afterwards. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? So Jeff, you're going to be consulting for May and a portion of June. You're working on the final investment plan that comes to a joint meeting of the board and the mayor's council. So the plan, Chair, is that this would be the period through May uh, 10th. We would uh, wrap that up and provide a report to you. I think we're scheduled for May 24th, uh, at which time, per Mayor Walton's comments, we would be taking any um, um, edits that we would bring forward, that staff recommendations coming out of the consultation with the public, with stakeholders, et cetera, as well as any thoughts that you have in taking direction and then make final revisions to the plan be posting that and um, looking for approval at the end of June. With fare increases in there, all sources we have to consult on, but with the fare increases as well, there are prescribed processes for that where we'll be posting it, uh, uh, proposing to post it on the Mayor's Council site, et cetera, for that too. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so if that's the end of the presentation from Jeff, um, I thank him. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and I ask everyone to be back in their seats uh, by that clock there, because there's a few different clocks around here, but by the clock at uh, 5 minutes after 12. Thank you all very much.